Well, it's good to be back. Thank you. Thank. Wow. Thanks. Yeah. Every, let's let's all clap. Well, why not? Yeah. I don't know what we're clapping for. Just kidding. <laughs> um, I hate missing Sundays, so I'm really glad that we we got in yesterday. Um, I've had a couple people ask me this question, you know, how are you guys doing with jet lag? I just, I don't get jet lag on the tail end of a trip. And when we go over adjusting, I don't really feel it that much either. So uh, it's fine. Like we're good. We're ready to go. Super excited at the season that the Lord has us here uh, right now in, in our fellowship. So I, man, I'm, I'm blessed to see you guys. I missed you even though it was just one Sunday. Excited to see what the Lord has for us coming up. Um, I know you guys were blessed with Pastor Larry, right? Last Sunday, what a what a great brother! Thankful and blessed for him. Um, if you need a Bible, raise your hand. We're in Ecclesiastes chapter six. We're coming up close to the knocking on the door to end the book of Ecclesians. Ecclesiastes. I don't know what Ecclesians is. We finished First Corinthians, and then now we're doing Ecclesiastes. So Ecclesians, we'll go with that. We're coming up to the end, and um, it's been it's been a good it's been a good study through. It's been it's been really blessed. Um, <clears throat> so turn with me to Ecclesiastes chapter 8, if you will. The title of today's message, if you're taking notes, the title of today's message is The King's Command. The King's Command, which is, which is pretty different from the title of the message two weeks ago, not last week because I wasn't here, but two weeks ago when we looked at the relationship between God and man and, and we saw that Solomon said very, put it very well, the beginning of wisdom is what of the Lord? The beginning of wisdom is fear. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. If you want to be a wise person, a good place to start is your submission to your consideration of God being in a place that is higher than you are. But now we, we move on from that. We understand to be wise is to fear God. We want to be wise and fear God. We want to grow in our wisdom. But we move on from that. And, and the title of today's message is The King's Command. We go to the, the everyday um, of of today. Governing authorities is what we're going to be talking about today. And I can't make this up, you guys. You guys think that I go through and like arrange the dates and figure everything out, but I don't do that. But thankfully, God is, is greater than my planning ability, and He just lines things up perfectly. The, the word for today we're going to get to in a second, and then it'll all make sense what I'm trying to say right now. The word for today... Uh, is chapter 8, but what, But let's do the review. What was chapter 1's word? Does anybody remember? Chapter 1, the first word of the day that we had? Somebody knows. Somebody said it. Purpose. You guys all right? Jumping jacks? Can we stand up and do some jumping jacks? Number 1, purpose. What was number 2? Contentment. What was number 3? <clears throat> Time. What was number 4? Companionship. What was number 5? Rest, what was number six? Reputation, what was number seven? Wisdom. The idea is we take a word from each week and we, we apply it to our lives that week, consider it, meditate, ponder it. The word for today is citizenship. Citizenship. And like I said, I can't really make this stuff work out better than the way that it does. I couldn't have planned this better, but we're going to be talking about citizenship today. We're going to be looking at where our priorities are as far as um, citizenship is concerned. You have dual citizenship. Did you guys know that? You have dual citizenship. There's three reasons, uh, three things that happened in the last couple weeks. Citizenship was brought up to me, and I've been thinking about it leading up to this study and the first thing, someone asked me about uh, born or inherent citizenship. 
or born citizenship. There's a technical term for it. I didn't realize that when they asked me that question, and I was going to be looking at citizenship today for today's study, I didn't realize, but this is big in the news right now. Do you guys realize that? I typed in born citizenship and this whole stuff. All this stuff comes up from like yesterday, the the same day. I guess there's some stuff happening in, in our government about born citizenship. And really what born citizenship is, it means that if you're born in a country, if you're born locationally, geographically there, then you automatically get citizenship. And the question was, why this came up originally was, the question was, hey, Tim, since three of your kids were born in Croatia, does that mean that they have dual citizenship, Croatian citizenship? And I said, no, actually, we get that question a lot. Just because my kids were born in Croatia does not mean that they have citizenship. In fact, the vast majority of countries in the world do not give you born citizenship for being born in that country. There, You have to prove a bloodline. You have to prove some kind of family connection. And then you have to go through a process. Citizenship is not that easily given. In fact, about 30 countries in the entire world practice born citizenship, the United States of America being one of them. Of over the about 200 or so countries in the world, that means that 15% of the world's population, the countries of the world, 15% have this thing called born citizenship, meaning that if you're born there, then you automatically get it. But it's not typical to automatically get Get this citizenship in most of the countries of the world that you're born in. It's 85%. Don't give it to you. So then I started thinking about it, and we're looking at citizenship. And then the next question uh, came up that I started to ponder, as many of you will. Especially yesterday, when I got home, and my mother-in-law, God bless her, Mama, I hope you're watching because I love you, and thank you for taking care of my kids for two weeks so I can go to Israel. I got home and what she did was typically what you would do if you're house sitting, babysitting for somebody is you take the mail that they get while they're gone and you put it on a little pile, right? On the counter, but not for the last two weeks in Las Vegas or many other places for that matter. She had to get a box with all of the stuff that was overflowing that I got. And then when I sorted through it, I was enamored of how many political postcards I got. And I was like, this is, this, is all, this is all political stuff telling me how to vote. And I had to sort through everything. And some of it I got two or three of. They're like, they really want me to understand that this guy is a terrible jerk <laughs> and deserves to be in prison. But then he says the same thing. I'm confused. Anyway, So I started to think and consider the second question, first citizenship based on dual citizenship or whatever. Second question, our privilege that we have in our country as a democracy to be able to vote for people to be in positions of authority over us. See, the Bible makes no distinction. It doesn't say if you live in a democracy, then you can obey the government and submit to them. There's, there's no qualifier for that in the Bible. The Bible says there's a governing authority that rules over you. You are to submit to it. We're going to talk more about that because I don't want to anybody to get upset or anything like that. This is a biblical mandate, a biblical principle that we have. So I started to think about, I have this privilege to vote. I'm going to be voting. I get to exercise a right of my citizenship, right? So I started to think about that. And that's interesting. And how am I going to, how am I going to do that? And I've gotten into, you know, discussions or talks with people and people, you know, they, they, they hear that I'm a pastor or whatever, and they want to ask me these political questions for whatever reason. And, and, and shame on them because they think that I'm not going to say anything. And I, I'll have the conversation with them. I'm like, let's talk about it. You know, there's one particular person recently who started to put the screws to me on some things politically. And I'm like, and I'm like constantly, and this is the reason why I don't mind having the conversation and I like it, because I'm constantly referring back to the kingdom of God. Like, this is my standard. This is my standard, and this is what's happening, so let's talk about it. You know, how can we reconcile that? Anyway, so they're going, they're very vehement about their position, and this and that, and blah, 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 and then, and then finally, I stopped. You know, I was thinking, like, this is getting a little, 
crazy. People get really passionate about this, apparently. I don't know what's going on. And I say, wait, you asked me what my position is and, and how I vote, but you never told me. So, like, what, what's your position and how do you vote? And they said, oh, he didn't vote in the last election. And I said, then why are we having this conversation? <laughs> Like, you have a right and a privilege as a citizen of this country in a democracy, and you want to have a very strongly viewed opinion about it, but you're not willing to engage in the process? That doesn't make any sense to me. Now, l listen to me when I say this, please. I am not trying to be divisive. I do not want to sway you to an opinion of thought or an ideology. That is not my intention whatsoever. If you ever get offended over anything that I say from up here on the political basis, just throw it out the window because my opinion does not matter. What I want to do is I want to stand and focus on what God's word says about government and what God's word says our responsibility is. And I want to hold ourselves, I want to hold myself accountable when it comes to that. So I'm saying that if we have citizenship and God gives us this, this, this opportunity to put people in, in authority over us, then why not engage in that or ask questions or talk about it? being careful not to do so in a way that, that is focusing more, listen to this carefully, that is focusing more on the earthly kingdom than it is on the eternal kingdom because there is a big difference. So with all that said, I, I want to I say something to you guys and I want you guys to take it to heart. I want you to take it seriously. I want you to think about it. It's the beginning of November. You know that? It's the beginning of November. Just like Grace said, before you know it, it's going to be Christmas and everything else, okay? I want you guys, plead with you, pray, ask you as emphatically as possible. I want you guys to be praying now on your prayer list today, tomorrow. I want you to be praying now about the conversations that you are going to have with your friends and family this holiday season coming up. I want you to be preemptive going into these conversations saying, God, I want your kingdom and your glory to be established and, and, and demonstrated through my life and not my position or disposition regarding what's happening in our country right now. Because you are going to have an opportunity to have conversations. And I say that to preface the rest of the study, what we're going to get into, this is very important. You're probably going to have opportunities and you're going to have a chance ultimately to share the gospel with somebody in light of our current political situation. You're going to have an opportunity, if you approach it correctly, to share the gospel, the love of God with somebody. I know that that doesn't sometimes seem like it can go together, but it has to for us. It has to go together. So that was the second thing. So the first thing, a citizenship, dual citizenship, second elections. And then the third thing is we just got back yesterday from a trip to Israel for two weeks, right? We're in a different country, we're meeting different people. There's a prophecy in the Old Testament that talks about how God says to the prophet, I want you to measure the temple area. Don't measure outside the temple area. Don't worry about it because that has been given over to the Gentiles for the trotting down of the Gentiles for a season. We didn't understand what that meant before, but now we go, and, and I saw, as we were in Jerusalem and as we were in Israel, I saw God's holy word come to life. I saw it come to life in a way that I've never experienced before. It was phenomenal. In fact, it was so phenomenal, I'll just do a shameless plug. We're already starting to prepare the, the, the beginning planning stages of our trip, trip that we're going to take next year in September. And, and I know that this will change your guys' life. Not in the sense that you'll have some kind of emotional experience because you'll be in the promised land, but in the sense that, that um, you will be able to seek God and see the fulfillment of his word come to pass in front of your face. So all that to say, here I am standing on the Temple Mount last week, a few days ago, and I'm surrounded by tour groups who represent, if I can be so bold to say, pretty much every tribe, nation, and tongue in the world. Jerusalem was was infatuated or, or inundated with, with different people from different cultures all over the world. And it's just like, they, they, they said it throughout the whole trip. 
Israel is the center of the world. Israel is the center of the earth. Israel is the center of the map. And you look at a map, and what do you look right in the middle? What is it? It's Israel right in the middle. And everybody, east, west, north, south, everybody from all over the world had all come together, had come together and gathered in Jerusalem. And it made me question. It made me think about it. It made me meditate on my citizenship whether it be American citizenship, USA, or even more so, more importantly, my heavenly citizenship that is the focus of our study today. So with those three things in mind going into the study in chapter 8, starting in verse 2, but we'll read 1 for posterity's sake. We finished with verse 1 two weeks ago. Before we go into the word, though, let's go ahead and pray. Father, we want to recognize this morning that, that you are a holy God. You are a righteous God. You are a good God. And we thank you for allowing us to be part of your kingdom. We thank you for calling us by name to be part of your family, for sanctifying us, setting us apart, making us different from the rest of the world. God, we pray that our perspective on kingdoms starts, it begins with your heavenly kingdom, eternal perspective, rather than the temporal and the things of this world that are, that are coming to pass. Nations rise and fall. Kings rise and fall. Political parties and affiliations rise and fall. But you remain the same forever. So God, with that in mind, going into your word this morning, with that in mind, we pray that you would open our eyes, give us ears to hear, what your spirit says to your church now, today, in the current state we find ourselves in, and how we can best represent you being citizens of a heavenly country whose founder and builder is you, God. So teach us this morning, lead us in, in your righteousness, we pray, and be glorified through our desire to be obedient to you and in our obedience. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Chapter 8, verse 1, who is like a wise man and who knows the interpretation of a thing? A man's wisdom makes his face shine and the sternness of his face is changed. We covered that a couple weeks ago. Verse 2, I say, keep the king's command for the sake of your oath to God. If you don't have that verse underlined in your Bible, which I'm sure is, you don't, you know, it's a kind of an obscure verse in the middle of Ecclesiastes toward the end, underline it. This is one of the most, if not the most profound verse speaking of governing authorities on earth. There's going to be some informational verses in the New Testament we look at. There's going to be some, some practical verses that we see that, that can give us direction and guidance in what this means. But this verse, in its profundity, says more than what we have time to expound on this morning. Let's read it again. I say, keep the king's commandment for the sake of your oath to God. What is he saying? He's saying, recognizing the governing authorities that are over you will place you in a position to be a witness of God Almighty. You have made certain oaths to God. What kind of oaths to God have you made as a believer in Jesus Christ? First and foremost, you've pledged obedience to God the Father as a disciple, as a disciple of our Lord Jesus Christ. You've, you've, you've submitted yourself to him in obedience and as you walk with him and you go through different things in life, your, obe your obedience to God and in the context of, of our political position, governing authorities right now is going to allow you to be a witness for God in very difficult, sometimes tumultuous times. In fact, I'll throw this out here in the beginning. Maybe we can follow up with it later again in the end. Your relationship with God, the seriousness that you take your citizenship in heaven, the more serious you are in, in your citizenship in heaven will allow you and enable you to be the best citizen on earth that you possibly can be, period. If you understand and take the heart and practice 
what your citizenship in heaven looks like, your rights as a citizen of heaven, the promises of, this, of you as a citizen of heaven, then you can be the best possible citizen on earth that is possible in this earthly kingdom, this current situation. What we find ourselves looking at and seeing is God's kingdom, God's perspective. Again, as we've seen throughout the book of Ecclesiastes, God's perspective is eternal. It's forever. It's lasting. The earth's kingdoms are temporal. We're going to look more at that in detail. Kingdoms rising, kingdoms fall over and over and over and over again. And any kind of investment, any kind of stock that we want to put in any kind of earthly kingdom is going to come to nothing eventually. There's a turnover. Philippians chapter 3, verse 17 through 21. You can turn there if you'd like. If not, we have it on the screen for you to see. Brethren... Join in following my example and note those who so walk as you, have a, as you have us for a pattern. For many walk of whom I have told you often and now tell you even weeping that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly and whose glory is their shame. This is one of the most descriptive verses of what it's like to be a carnal Christian. What he says, he weeps over these people who have been given over to destruction in, in their, their thinking. He says, we have set for you a pattern. Follow that pattern. And you can see in people's lives that there's godly patterns that are set that, that produce life and contentment in life and the manifestation of God's glory. And there's patterns of life for people that produce death and consequences and an unfulfilled life. He says, we have shown you the latter. We have shown you a good pattern to, to follow after that pattern. But some of these people have given themselves over to destruction, he says. And he says this thing so descriptive. I love one of my most favorite pictures of a carnal Christian or a backsliding Christian. And he says that their gods are their belly. <laughs> what does that mean? Their gods are their belly. He's however they feel, whatever they want to consume, whatever their position is, whatever their disposition is, that's what they do. It's not regulated by scripture. It's not regulated by relationship with God. It's regulated on how do I feel today? Do I want to have McDonald's for lunch or Taco Bell? McDonald's would be walking in the spirit. Taco Bell would be walking in the flesh. Everybody knows that. Taco Bell's nasty. Any food that you keep in your car for more than five minutes and it turn, and smells like, I don't know what it smells like. Sorry. Yeah, that's just for fun, you guys, okay? No worries. The point is, what drives you? Is it your own passions? He says they're gods or their belly. What I want is what I get. What I want is what I do. Follow the process of thought. Their end is destruction, destruction, whose God is their belly, whose glory is in their shame, who set their mind on earthly things. This is the thing. This is the focus. They set their mind on earthly things. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. Can I get an amen? Amen. Your citizenship is in heaven, and the, the conforming of your body will be to the, the glory of the body of Christ. That's what he says. But there's a little backstory to this, a little history to this that I want to remind you of this morning, if you did not already know. The Philippians, the, the church in Philippi, the city itself of Philippi, had a special kind of relationship with Rome, historically speaking. Think about this for a second, okay? The relationship that Philippi had was on par to none. They had a special kind of relationship. The revolts that would happen, the civil wars that would come up, 
Philippi as a city would stand with Rome and say, we are Roman, we are not giving in to the rebels, we're not giving in to this, we're not trying to overthrow our position in the Roman government, we're not trying to become our own entity. They stood with Rome through these various civil wars that were happening. Because of their position, the Caesar came back and endowed Philippi with a special blessing that they alone had received and that was unprecedented anywhere in the Roman Empire. Do you know what that was? Because of their position, because of them standing in the place that they were to be, Rome, the Caesar, granted the entire city of Philippi Roman citizenship. This is pretty incredible. This does not happen often. In fact, you remember when Paul's getting beat and he had enough. He's like, I'm tired of this treatment. I am a Roman citizen. And as soon as he said it, people started losing their minds. What? You didn't tell us you were a Roman citizen. We're not allowed to beat you. Yeah, well, I am. And now I'm appealing to Caesar. Okay, don't touch this guy. Leave him alone. He's a Roman citizen. Of the entire population of the empire of Rome, 10% of which had citizenship. That means 90% of the empire was non-citizen. Philippi had a special, unique place in that the entire city was granted citizenship. So when Paul writes to Philippi, talking about citizenship, they knew exactly what he was saying. Not only did he uh, appoint the citizens of Philippi as with citizenship, Roman citizenship, but it went a step further and he made it a special city for retiring military. As they would come out of service and retire, he made it a retirement city for them to go and live. So you want to talk about patriotic? Philippi was a patriotic city, a Roman city with current and retired military officials And they knew exactly what it meant when Paul was talking to them about their heavenly citizenship and how that needed to be the focus for them. He didn't take away from the fact that they were citizens of Rome. He didn't put down the fact that they had retirees and vets living in their midst. He didn't pick sides or choose. He just let them know that what was the most important position for them to have was the relationship that they had with God in the, in, the, in the heavenly, in the eternal scheme of citizenship. And it goes on, it gets deeper, for our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior. It's no secret, historically speaking, that the Caesars would be called saviors. They were deity They had some kind of divinity, living gods, and they were referred to as Savior so-and-so. The Caesar was the the people's Savior, Pax Romana. The peace of the the, the Roman Empire was brought on by force, and it was the divinity of the Roman Caesar who had his, his saviorship that the people would worship him through. So again, when Paul says to the church in Philippi, our Savior, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, he's removing that title from Caesar and he's applying it to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords in the most patriotic city in the, in the empire at that time, which is pretty remarkable. Which, by the way, is what the Christians started to get in trouble for and persecuted for later under different waves of persecution. They would not give this title as Savior any longer to Caesar. They would only attribute it and give it, it, give it to Jesus Christ, which they got in trouble for. So it makes sense. He's talking to them about citizenship. We look at our position as Americans, and we think of our privilege I've heard people say, I'm glad that we're not like other countries. There was even a guy on this last trip that was talking about how, he prou- how proud he is to be an American, which is all good and well and fine. But at the moment that we start focusing more on our identity in, in this temporal realm of citizenship, we find ourselves in big trouble by, by causing it or, or allowing it to be greater than, than, than the precious calling that we have as eternal citizens of, of heaven. And for us, as, as much as we can be good 
citizens of heaven. And according to the scripture and what God teaches us, we're able to be the best citizens on earth that, that's possible, whatever, whatever position we find ourselves in. Wherever we are, whatever country we are in. For our citizenship is in heaven. I say, keep the king's commandment for the sake of your oath to God. For the sake of your oath to God, you are a representative of God even in the current political climate that you find yourself in. Do not be hasty to go from his presence. Do not take your stand for an evil thing, for he does whatever he pleases. The king is the one in charge ultimately at the end of the day. Be careful how you go in, how you come out. Where the word of the king is, there is power. And who may say to him, what are you doing? He who keeps his command will experience nothing harmful and a wise man's heart discerns both time and judgment. Because for every matter, there is a time and a judgment. I highlighted this because this is so important, even in the context of what we're talking about. There is a time for everything. There is a time that you get to choose on what hill you are going to die for what things. And this, this thing may be really important for you, and, and you, you may be passionate about it, but just remember that it may not be the right time to 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 raise your flag on that hill. It may come in the future, but ask yourself this question in wisdom, be wise. Is it that time? Romans chapter 13, verses three through four, speak more about these verses. He who keeps his command will experience nothing harmful. If you want to turn there to your far right, you can. Chapter 13, verses three through four, or you can look up to the screen. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Question mark. Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For he is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is God's minister, an avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. Now, whenever we start talking about earthly citizenship, whenever we start talking about governments, inevitably, I always get this question pretty, pretty quickly, very regularly, but pretty quickly. They say, okay, well, God says that we should submit ourselves to the governing authorities, blah, 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 whatever. But what if it's a corrupt government? What if they're terrible? What if they don't do anything right? Well, listen, God understands, in fact, that's the reason he instituted government was to differentiate uh, good and evil. He understands that, and God will take care of those people, and he will bring them down, and he will rise somebody else up. This is the cycle that we say throughout history. We have righteous kings, and then they become corrupt, and they're brought down. We have righteous governments, and they're brought up, and then they become corrupt, and they get brought down. This is something that we can... We can <laughs> Be sure of in the future that God is going to take care of business when it comes to the institution of government that he set up. He's not going to allow people to go all crazy. Your responsibility to him is to submit to him and have your focus on the eternal kingdom of God for eternity, and he'll take care of the temporal he talks about this a little bit more, and we're going to see it illustrated in a few verses. I don't want to get too much more into it, but because of every matter, there is a time and judgment, though the misery of man increases greatly. Yeah, things can get difficult. Things can get hard. Things can get tough, and you may think it's time to die on that hill, but, but know this, as you seek God and you ask him, he will answer in regards to corrupt leadership, for he does not know what will happen, so who can tell him when it will occur. Not even the king knows what's going to happen. Not even the president. You ask the president what's going to happen next year, he'll laugh in your face. He has no idea. It's too far away. You ask him what's going to happen next week, he's trying to figure out right now. You know how things happen so quickly? It's so crazy. He, has, he doesn't know what's going to happen tomorrow. No one has power over the spirit to retain the spirit. No one has power in the day of death. There's a greater authority at play here. Somebody dies, it changes the whole picture, just like that. 
We had a neighbor moving across the street from us, Caddy Corner, not directly across, but the next house. And um, about, I want to say, eight months ago or so, maybe a year. And um, met the guy a few times, talked to him. He's probably... 50s, 60s or something. I don't know. He's looking for a place to settle down. He buys the house. Seems like a nice guy. I get a call while, while I'm in Israel from my neighbor to tell me that he died. He just died. You know, the, the police were over there. It was on Halloween night, October 31st. And, and I have great neighbors. And he's like, I just want to let you know what's going on over here. Our neighbor, our newer neighbor, he just passed away. And I'm like, man, just like that, just like that. There's a greater authority he says, not only does a king not know, but, but you have to take into consideration that life is fleeting. Nobody has power in that day over death. There is no release from that war and wicked, wickedness will not deliver those who are given to it. There's an accountability for wickedness that's going to take place, period. And wickedness cannot overcome the judgment that is coming. All this I've seen and applied my heart to every work that is done under the sun. There's a time in which one man rules over another to his own hurt. It goes both ways. There's a ruler that rule over the people for their own hurt, and there's a ruler that rules over the people to his own hurt. This is the temporal system that we find ourselves in. Let's look at verse 10, which is I, I highlighted as well on the screen, if you can see. Then I saw the wicked buried who had come and gone from the place of holiness, and they were forgotten in the city where they had so done. Well, this is interesting because it's still talking about rulers. It's still talking about citizenship. It's still talking about kingdoms. He's talking specifically about a city. And he says that, that he saw the wicked buried who had come and gone from the place of holiness. What does that mean? It means there's people that start off really good. Absolute power corrupts absolutely. And when you find people or you see people in a position of authority and power and they get to exercise that, uh, that power and authority, what can come and many times does come, we've seen historically and biblically read through Kings, First and Second Kings. What we see is that there's some corruption that comes in and there's an account that is always given. He started in a place of holiness. But he'd gone from that place and they were forgotten. Remember, holiness, we're, talking, we're not talking about halos and angel wings. We're talking about holiness as a sanctified position. Uh, holiness as somebody who's different, that doesn't do things, the rest of the, the world does things. Isn't that the, the pitch that everybody gives us that wants to get into office? Right? I'm going to do it differently. I'm going to do it better. I'm going to do it the best way. I'm not going to be like these corrupt politicians. And who knows to what degree they are or aren't. That's not my argument. But he says that he started in a good place. He started in a place of separateness, holiness. They were forgotten in the city where they had so done. One of the most remarkable things about my time in Israel, and by the way, I didn't say this at the beginning of the service, which I did at the first service. Um, I don't, I'm not going to be talking about too much the trip because I was like, I am like blowing up with my desire to talk about Israel. So this evening, our Sunday evening service, I'm dedicating to the past, present, or past, present, current, and future state of Israel and how it looks biblically. So I'm going to be talking about the trip more tonight if you want to come back for that service, if you're interested in hearing more about the Israel trip that we just got back from. But one of the most remarkable things that I experienced on this trip is these tells. Anybody heard of a tell before? A tell is an ancient city that has risen to its certain position wherever today over generations and hundreds of years of conquest. So literally, like we're standing on top of Mount Carmel and we're looking out from Mount Carmel at the Valley of Megiddo. And it's this huge valley that the Bible prophesies that the armies of the world will gather together in opposition against God. And here I am standing on the top of this mountain that Elijah and the prophets of Baal went toe to toe. And I'm looking out at the, at the valley of Megiddo and you can almost see in your mind's eye, the, the, it's so huge. All of the armies of the world gathered together against God and his people. 
And I'm just blown away. And, and, and I was told, you know, a while beforehand, I was told that, Tim, you're going to be the one. We have three pastors on the trip. We split the teachings between the three pastors. And they said, you're going to be the one that's going to cover the, the Megiddo, Armageddon. I'm like, great. You know, my first time to Israel, they're making me do Armageddon. So I'm standing up on Mount Carmel. I'm looking out. I'm like, well, why don't they have the teaching done up here where we can see? And they had, obviously, one of the other pastors did the teaching on Elijah and the Mount Carmel, prophets of Baal, you know, the whole, the whole story there. So they had him up there, and then we were going to a different location. I was like, well, why don't I do it up here? You can see the whole valley anyway, whatever. And, and I found out soon the reason was because there's a tell called Megiddo, which was a military uh, position. Uh, a tell is these layers of of civilization, where what happens is they would have this military outpost or this community, and then somebody would come and defeat them, and then they would stomp, stomp, stomp everybody, and then they would build their place on top, and then somebody else would come and defeat them, stomp, 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 and then build their thing on top, and it would keep going, and the tell at Megiddo had 26 layers of people coming and defeating and building, coming, defeating and building, coming, defeating and building, coming and defeating and building over and over and over again. And this is why, because there's nothing new under the sun. And governments will rise and fall and people will be put in positions where as soon as wickedness starts to come in, God will address it, especially in that context, biblical wise. So here we are in the far end of the valley up by where the mountains go up and the mountains of Israel are incredible. I never understood what it talked about, what it meant when it talked about the, the mountains of Israel. The mountains are going up, they're covered in trees, and then you have this, this plain, this valley, and this mound of dirt that just rises up out of nowhere with all these ruins at the top, and it's the Tell of Megiddo. So here we are standing at the top of 26 layers of conquest over and over again, and here we are looking out from that point at the Valley of Megiddo, where historically speaking, there has been more lives, more bloodshed, more wars in that particular place than anywhere else on the earth. It's incredible. And we see this cycle again. And but sometimes for some reason or whatever, we think certain people are better than others. They're not. Man is corrupt. The glory of the gospel of Jesus Christ is that he meets us where we're at. He meets us in a corrupt state and starts to rehabilitate us from that moment. But as far as apart from God, as far as not focused on the eternal citizenship and kingdom of God, man has just made a mess over and over and over and over again. Listen to this. It says it in the verse, verse 10. And I saw the wicked buried then I saw the wicked buried. Do not think that you can get away with wickedness. And when I say you, I mean the whole world. Do not think that you can get away with wickedness. God is going to hold an account. I saw the wicked buried. And then I looked at that tell, 26 layers tall. We had to hike all the way to the top of it. These, the, they, they, they tunneled through the middle of the, the, toll, the tell and down into the rock, down to a spring in, inside. It was incredible to be able to get water so they couldn't be sieged by the enemy. They had water within the tell in a secret entrance that they could go down to where the spring was. 26 levels, I've seen the wicked buried over and over and over again. This is also vanity because the sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily and therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. Isn't that true? Read that again. Because the sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. What does that mean? It means that when people, it seems like people need to be held accountable for their sins and they're not, it just strengthens other people in their sin to continue doing it. Well, if they're not going to be held accountable for the bad things that they're doing, then I'm not going to be held accountable for the bad things I'm doing. And then before you know it, everybody's corrupt. And this is how a society collapses 
You have corruption at the top, then you have everybody pointing to the top, and you have everybody pointing at each other, and the corruption has gone straight through because if you're not going to be held accountable, then I'm not going to be held accountable, and I'm going to do whatever I want, and then boom, 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 I've seen the wicked buried. Though a sinner does evil a hundred times and his days are prolonged, yet I surely know that it will be well with those who fear God, who fear before him. This is the glory. This is the glory of God. The wisdom of God is the fear of God. Those who fear God, those who humble themselves before him, those who place themselves before him with an eternal perspective, a heavenly citizenship will be okay. Yes, people will be upset about wickedness. They'll be upset about how long it takes to judge. They'll give themselves over to it because of that. But for us who fear God, God will take care. Yet I surely know that it will be well. It will be well. It will not be well with the wicked, nor will he prolong his days, which are as a shadow, because he does not fear before God. There's a vanity which occurs on earth, that there are just men to whom it happens according to the work of the wicked. Again, there are wicked men to whom it happens according to the work of the righteous. I said that this also is vanity. Now we get to this point where we've seen multiple times, three, four, five times. So I commended enjoyment because a man has nothing better under the sun than to eat, drink, and be merry. For this will remain with him in his labor all the days of his life, which God gives him under, under the sun. Do you remember the first time we ran across the same, the same phrase in the book of Ecclesiastes? What the word for that um, study was. Do you guys remember? Contentment. That was the first time in chapter two, he talks about how you know, the, the world is crazy, life is crazy. Be content with what you have. Be content with the position that God has given you. Be content with your, with your job and, and, and be thankful for what God has given to you. Enjoy what you get to eat and drink. Enjoy his provision, even if it's Taco Bell, I guess. Enjoy the goodness of God don't worry about all the craziness of the rest of the world. So all things considered, he says, it is good. I commend enjoyment because a man has nothing better under the sun than to eat, drink, and be merry. For this will remain with him in his labor all the days of his life with which God gives under the sun. This is an under the sun statement, which means he's talking about what kingdom? Church, you guys remember, we've said this multiple times. What does under the sun mean in this context? The temporal He's talking about on earth, you want to have some kind of contentment and satisfaction? At least have it in these things, but he is not talking about the eternal. It may be connected to some degree. We may find some kind of contentment in those things. But when we have an, earth, an earthly perspective, it only, that only goes for us so far. We have a heavenly perspective when we consider, meditate on our heavenly citizenship, our rights as a heavenly citizen, then we'll be blessed on the eternal spectrum, not just the temporal. We've talked about that multiple times, so let's move on. Verse 16, when I applied my heart to know wisdom and to see the business that is done on the earth, even though one sees no sleep day or night, then I saw all the work of God, that a man cannot find out the work that is done under the sun. For though a man labors to discover it, yet he will not find it. Moreover, though a wise man attempt to know it, he will not be able to find it. And this is his recognition of the fact that it is good for enjoyment. It is good for eating and drinking. But as you continue to seek, you do find that there's a falling short when you're not having the eternal lens of perspective of life. What to expect, the hope, the future and hope you have. Which again is connected to the glorious gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's the confidence that we have. That maybe countries, kings, political parties will rise and fall. Our king is the king of kings now and forever. He will not fall We can have some kind of contentment. Godly contentment is great gain on this earth 
in God's provision for us, but with an eternal perspective, it's going to be greater. The satisfaction is going to be greater. And we, as heavenly citizens, sanctified unto God and understanding what that looks like and means, will be in the best place to be the best possible citizens on earth in the earthly kingdoms we find ourselves in. The best possible citizens, if we have that perspective right, seeking God's kingdom first and his righteousness, all these things will be added unto you. In closing, I have three questions for you guys that I want you to think about and meditate on this week. Number one, where do you take more pride in your citizenship? Where do you take more pride in your citizenship? And the reason I feel like I have to ask this question is because I know brothers and sisters in the Lord whom I love dearly, who I I want to encourage greatly, who find themselves more identifying with the the earthly citizenship than, than the eternal. They just do. And that's what they want to be passionate about. And I just... I want it to be a word of warning. Where do you take pride? And answering the question should create or produce the conviction that's necessary. Well, I take more pride in this one. I take more pride in the fact that I'm an American citizen. Yeehaw, we're the best in the world. I'm good at yeehawing too. And and if that's the case, man, wow, be careful because you're not going to be able to be the kind of citizen on earth that God desires you to be if, if that's the priority. Number two, how does that answer to that last question? How does that come out of your life? How's that shown? How's it shown? People are going to be able to see it. If you identify more with an earthly citizenship than with a heavenly, people are going to be able to see it. If you identify more with a heavenly citizenship than an earthly, people are going to be able to see it. When you have those questions that come up, when you have those conversations, and you've been filtering the Word of God, you've been filtering and thinking about God's heart for mankind, and that they wouldn't just be another layer in the tell, another brick in the wall. You guys like that? Poppy people. Just another brick in the wall. If you don't want to be, then consider your heavenly citizenship and how that comes out in your life. Number three, do your rights and blessings as a believer. You notice how I said that I did that on purpose. Do your rights and blessings as a believer help you to be a better earthly citizen? Because it should. It definitely should. My rights and benefits as a believer are far, far, far greater than my rights and benefits as a citizen of an earthly kingdom. And we pray. We pray. We do what we uh, should do as earthly citizens. And we pray for God's best. We pray for the, the toppling of corruption and wickedness now. And we do our due diligence and see what Tuesday brings as heavenly-minded, heavenly-focused citizens of the kingdom of God as we continue to pray and seek God for his kingdom to come, his will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen? We're going to take communion. So they're going to get the communion element set up while the worship team is playing this last song. I'd like you guys to come forward, receive the elements of communion, return to your chairs, and we're going to stand and receive them corporately. Father God, we thank you for your perspective. We thank you for your truth. Thank you for reminding us. Sometimes we can get passionate about things that that are a little misguided. But you you are good and you're, you're gracious and willing to readjust our perspective, to readjust our feelings about things, God. We want to be those people. We want to be your children, your men and your women, your sons and your daughters who are good citizens of heaven, meaning that we are submitted to, in reverence to you, seeking you in all areas and aspects of our life, loving each other, loving our neighbors, loving our enemies 
as a witness against the evil of this generation. And that, God, you would be the one that would use us with that heavenly perspective to be the salt and the light of the earth. So, God, we thank you for that perspective. We thank you for that reminder. And we love you and pray these things in Jesus' name.